Thank you. It's a, a great pleasure in, to have the opportunity to bring to you some thoughts that emerge from very detailed research, research about the internet and the telecommunications industry and the political economy underlying it, research that is based on efforts to describe, to measure, to understand the architecture and the dynamics of the, of the internet, and to problematize it. And our way of problematizing it in academia is, of course, different from the way it would be problematized in the international communities and in the business world. And so what I'm hoping is that this will be, as Secretary General Torre would hope, an opportunity to contribute a different perspective to the debate. And let me anticipate for you my final conclusion. Usually my seminars go for two or three hours, but I will try to cut to the chase and make my main points in less than 15 minutes. My final conclusion is contained within the title that I've given this little presentation, which is Europe's internet from a post-Dubai perspective. Europe's internet is a distinct form of the internet. And indeed, I will describe to you how our research has been able to show where these distinctions in regions really exist and what the importance of them are for the governance of forms of the internet as disaggregated and what that then means for a generalized view of what the agenda for the internet ought to be as we move forward. Well, the recent controversies about the governance of the internet are based, I believe, upon fundamental differences of opinion as to whether or not it is healthy and sustainable for the near future. Many would wish to apply the maxim, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And former FCC chairman and current US ambassador to the European Union, William Kennard, said that. Similarly, FCC commissioner Robert McDowell wrote earlier this year that the multi-stakeholder governance practices that have worked so far to ensure an extensive, vibrant internet ought to be allowed to continue to provide whatever is needed. Those multi-stakeholder bodies, such as ICANN and the Internet Society, have indeed been effective up to now in stimulating innovation, in creating new markets, and presiding over the growth of many of the features that we associate with the success that the internet has become. It's also created a system that tends to work against authoritarian and repressive forces that would like to have greater ease in censoring or restricting communication or building national intranets separate from the rest of the internet, as is to some degree the case in China and perhaps increasingly Iran. There is good reason to fear, though, that this congenial state of affairs is not sustainable. And the picture looks rather different from outside of the United States, and indeed outside of the way in which, historically, the discussion has been held within those multi-stakeholder organizations. After the ITU conference in Dubai last December, it's become clear that the global dimension of the internet must be reconsidered. The Dubai conference, regardless of the outcome of the ITU treaty, has made it clear that there are divergences on how the internet industry could and should evolve in the future. We cannot complacently assume that the internet is global. Indeed, it may never have been global, but certainly the ideals no longer look the same in the reinterpretation since Dubai. The reality is that the internet behaves in a distinctly regional way, and we have to understand how and why. The European internet and telecommunications sector in particular has been challenged on their business structure and future viability by many factors that can be summarized 
in four broad areas. First, a significant shift in revenue streams driven by the expansion of the internet and especially by mobile applications. If you follow the money, the profile of underlying finance looks very different now from 10 years ago, certainly. Second, the increase in EU and national service expectations, such as the Digital Agenda for Europe 2020 and national broadband plans, these require very significant investments that affect shareholder dividends. Third is the major change in users and patterns of digital services and products. And fourth is the formation and evolution of interrelated digital platforms for service. So far, these areas have each been addressed separately by different participants with the consequence of a high level of fragmentation between business strategies and approaches from political economy to governing the internet and the telecom sector. And research that we're trying to do, and indeed many colleagues in academic life are trying to do, on the changing architecture and the changing trends in finance can show this very clearly. And I think it's worth paying detailed attention to how this actually gives us a new picture of how the internet might be governed based on an understanding of how it really looks dynamically. Now the network operators will deal with these challenges by assessing two features, the strategic problems of the current business layout and what the sector needs to define provision and achieve to continue being competitive. Many European incumbent companies are facing expenses to upgrade their networks on an unprecedented scale since the privatization and liberalization moves initiated from 1998. Up to that time, infrastructure policy as well as investment was publicly led. This time, there is impetus for public policy initiatives to meet EU goals and national goals for widespread high broadband access. But the expectation is that the investment will be at least 90% privately funded. And well, after the cuts of, uh, in broadband funds in the negotiations of the EU multi-annual financial framework, as highlighted by Under Secretary Vary, it looks like the EU is offering something on the order of, if my calculations are right, 0.65% of what the infrastructure upgrade requirements are. So in the European context, the goals of service defined in the statutory formation of telephone companies, as well as in the regulatory framework, presents a serious difficulty when coming to define policy based on the underlying economics of the industry. These, in turn, have been generated by a variety of national regulatory regimes that have differential effects upon different elements of the overall network. Some of these regimes have created regulatory options that preserve elements of self-regulation. Some are intended to provide general guidelines for specific parts of the industry, and others are intended to correct for specific instances of market failure as is the case, of course, with certain price setting constraints. But the risk associated with not providing a sustainable platform for the development of the future European internet industry will not only mean in real terms the end of the current prevailing business model, but they could also seriously affect GDP growth and aspects of the labor market, perhaps through job losses. I'm not pessimistic about the, the labor market effects. I've done some detailed work on where jobs are lost and where they're created. And the good news is that the bottom line is positive, not negative, but I'm afraid it's small numbers. What's interesting is to see the labor market effects expressed in terms of where the shifts occur 
and what kinds of jobs in which locations taken on by what kinds of trained individuals actually have those effects. It would also affect the European technology innovation cycles and the telecom operators and many other players in the internet and digital economy contribute significantly through their research and development budgets. But in Europe, their relative ineffectualness is not likely to be changed by cajoling, but rather by a better recognition that there are elements of the internet economy themselves that with critical roles to play in IP, especially through traffic management. Europe is disadvantaged in relation to the rest of the world in terms of innovation, despite having made considerable progress in many aspects, including infrastructure. Now, some argue that this comes from the first mover advantage that the Silicon Valley companies and other US firms have had. But I'm afraid that 15 years after first mover advantage, we no longer can continue to expect that the dominance of the industry should be quite so imbalanced. The consequence of this is a diminished effect on the ability of European firms, both those managing the networks and those offering services over those networks for European customers. But of course, there's an interesting natural economic experiment taking place with the behavior of European firms outside of Europe, observing the way in which they practice as competitors and service providers in Latin America, Africa, and elsewhere. These are not characteristics then inherent to the European firms themselves. It's characteristics of the European firms practices within Europe. These disadvantages have to be addressed through evidence-based policy making both through regulation and other policy instruments, and through better informed business strategy. There is need for better understanding and of metrics of those roles and practices and of the many emerging agents, such as the content delivery networks and the internet exchanges and their business relations with those who operate the networks. This will be all the more important as high bandwidth using content, especially video over the internet, of course the services being devised for mobile internet, machine to machine connections through payment systems and monitoring systems. These continue to grow dramatically and shift the way in which business models take place and indeed challenge old business models with considerable disruptive potential. While it may be the case that the network operates without apparent breaks currently, the system, I'm afraid, does show evidence of structural cracks. Cracks that are especially notable when compared with the goals defined in the European digital agenda. When cautionary voices were raised about the structural flaws in the financial system, they were frequently told that the system's not broken, so it doesn't need fixing. This was common parlance in the early 2000s. We cannot allow analogous imbalances and structural flaws to persist in the internet to breaking point. If in the past, network operators could afford to cope with the changing internet around them, this is no longer the case. They need to react quickly to the transition to a different kind of digital market for products and services that will work structurally, managerially, organizationally, and in terms of how the system is governed. These changes cannot be built upon the legacy of a single, simple national monopoly when the internet is structured as a network of networks and by no means a smooth map of networked networks. Some of those networks compete, some have interconnections delimited by business criteria, and much of the future economy 
takes place according to new commercial practices based on modular rather than layered models of enterprise, layered models that are attractive and explanatory in engineering terms, but no longer have the force to show us how the internet works now that modularization is the dominant business practice. We need to see a new kind of relationship between the public interests of a vibrant communications network and the ways businesses behave on the internet. Europe should move away from efforts artificially to stimulate competition through outmoded economic models of access and pricing and move to mechanisms that take into account the emerging business models based on digital platforms. We see this as the prevailing structure. We should behave as if that's how things really do work. Furthermore, due to specific regional characteristics of network industries, achieving a larger scale at the national level is one of the keys to operating in the digital economy. In this context, market structures artificially pursued by sector-specific practices and competition law within the European Union bond boundaries really don't seem to work. New regulatory practices are unlikely to solve these business model problems. Subsidiarity can no longer easily be reconciled with uh, ambition for a real digital single market. Only when we work through with evidence-based analysis and policies can we expect to see European digital economy firms competing in the same realm as the leading firms from abroad. And only then will we be able to face up to the challenge of accommodating the realities of differential participation in enterprise of the network economy as the new global agenda for the internet. Thank you. <laughs>